Hi, my name is Gustavo Nunes Gretkin, and I want to talk to you about this idea of using a function for its name and not to call or invoke it. I'm going to demonstrate this experimental package called FixArgs that shows some of these patterns. The point of the talk is to focus on the idea rather than on the specific implementation in the package. To get started, let's use an example based on vcat, which is how we concatenate vectors. To concatenate a vector of vectors, we can use a higher order function reduce, and we get the result that we want. Let's do the same thing, but now use an anonymous function instead of directly calling vcat, and we can time the two. In summary, the second one is 500 times slower, and that's because totally different code is running in each case. If we look at the methods of reduce, we do see that there's a special case for vcat. There are two key features that get this to work. One is multiple dispatch, and the other is that the function is encoded in the type domain. Each function is its own type. Without these features, we would need to name that special code reduce underscore vcat, or perhaps flatten. Personally, the first spelling is better because it combines existing and meaningful names instead of introducing an ad hoc name. Calling reduce with vcat might not even call vcat. vcat is used as a name. This matters a lot in Julia because we work hard to find the right meaning for a given function so that generic programming can work. And I think that we should keep reusing these names where possible because naming things is hard. The original motivation for fix args was to generalize fix1 and fix2 in base. What are those? Let's use equals equals as an example. f1 and f2 are basically the same function. For a given input, they compute the same output, which is whether the input is equal to 50. Notice that the type of f1 is this fix2 type, and that the equals equals function and the type of 50 are both part of the type. f2 has this special name, which is not something I recommend dispatching on. We want f1 and f2 to behave identically, and they do when we pass them to find first. But I can tell you that the first one is a constant time operation, and the second one is linear in the number of elements in this range here. It's the same thing again. There is a find first method defined for this special case. And it's what you would expect. This is one thing I love about Julia. You can imagine a plotting library that supports evenly spaced ticks and unevenly spaced ticks. You can use an object like this to represent the evenly spaced ticks. And if you have code written in terms of find first and functions like it, you can perform efficient operations on that representation while still supporting the unevenly spaced ticks. So you can handle the general case without affecting performance in the special case. FixArgs provides a generalization of fix1 and fix2 in a few ways. You can use functions of any positional arity and any number of its arguments can be bound. A function can also have its keyword arguments bound. And you can represent call expressions on their own, not just partially applied functions. A quick example of where fixing keyword arguments would already be useful is in the isAprox partial function in base. All other partial functions use fix2, but this one cannot because the keyword arguments matter. So do we want to encode lambda calculus in types? Is it ever useful to fix all of the arguments of a function? To me, the answer is definitely yes. This will be a silly example, but let's consider the division function. If you fix its two arguments, that looks a lot like a rational number to me. So for example, to represent a half, and here's where we start using the package, we can use this x quote macro to create these objects. If you multiply these two objects together, we don't know how to do that, and we get a method error. But we can define the method using other macros. So here we define a method for multiplying t divided by t by t divided by t. <laughs> and a half times a half now gives you a representation for a quarter, where you have here the 1 and the 4. Notice that the dollar sign is used to escape the x quoting. Without the dollar sign, you defer all the function calls, including the multiplications, not just the division. Where does the connection between rational and division happen in base? Well, it happens in this method. In fixargs, you can use the function xeval to evaluate the form. The type already encodes that it's a division of two things. I want to compare some low-level details. First of all, the size of this object is the same as the corresponding rational object. Even the memory layout is identical. Let's look at the code generated to convert this rational to a float. It's also identical. 
That said, it is not a drop-in replacement for rational because while a rational subtypes number, the call object in fixed args cannot. Using this instead of based on rational seems pretty silly and confusing, but there are some possible benefits. Some users want to have different types for the numerator and the denominator, and I think a perfect example for this is something like a fixed point number where the denominator is encoded in the type. There are more examples in the documentation, but I'll give you a glimpse that we use this quadruple colon s to mark this argument as static, and then the value here is in the type domain. There is a kind of combination of structural and nominal typing here, because we avoid choosing names like rational, num, and den. The fields can be distinguished by the role they play with respect to the function. Only the function needs a name, and the rest is determined structurally. The same point can be made differently. If we x quote an identity function, we get this value every time. Whereas if we create a lambda function, we get things that do not compare equal to each other, even though they are structurally identical. And in case you're wondering, fixed args does support all sorts of nested lambda expressions correctly, as you'd hope. There are some existing patterns that this relates to, because any eager function can have a lazy representation now. So base.generator could be a lazy representation of map. Many of the types in the iterators module are in one-to-one -one correspondence with functions, and that correspondence can be made explicit using fixed args. Having a concise name is still valuable, and so an alias can be used to keep existing method definitions relatively clean. Literal powers in Julia lower specially, for good reason, and that could be replaced by something more general, perhaps, like using this, where again the static annotation shows up. This is the same pattern as what happens with broadcasting in Julia, where instead of an X eval call, we have materialize. This pattern shows up in other packages like lazy arrays and lazy sets. I want to be clear that this is different from quoting expressions in base because there you would get a bunch of symbols and with fixed args you actually get the evaluation of x, the division, and the y. It's also not the same as something like the term type in symbolic utils where the types for the function and the arguments are intentionally marked as any so that the compiler does not generate a bunch of code for different types. I don't recommend this, but if you really wanted to, you could define the imaginary unit as being a lazy square root of negative one. You can't evaluate that, but you can represent it symbolically now, and you can use that to represent complex numbers. It even has the same memory layout as the complex numbers built into Julia. Note that all of these expressions will have different types, and that can be a downside, though you could try to normalize it. Speaking of downsides, trying to do a lot of code reuse, like unifying literal power with broadcasting, probably increases coupling and has unintentional effects. The types here get pretty large, and that can influence compile times. Also, if you're not careful, you can get lots of method ambiguities. Thanks!